grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. See how good and joyful it is. We sing the hymn 557, Praise to the Holiest in the Height. Let us pray in one voice. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pause to bring to mind our sinfulness 
and God's loving forgiveness before confessing together. For when we have brought discredit on the gospel in thought and word or deed, Lord, forgive. For those times when we have broken the unity of the church, Christ, forgive. For the occasions when we have failed to love others as we should, Lord, forgive. May... Almighty God, who is both power and love, forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit upon your church and people, that we may build each other up in holiness and peace, through Christ our Lord. Amen. All praise to you, Holy Spirit. The reading is from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 18. God has not placed the angels as rulers over the new world to come, the world of which we speak. Instead, as it is said somewhere in the scriptures, what is man, O God, that you should think of him? Mere man, that you should care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and made him ruler over all things. It says that God made man ruler over all things. This clearly includes everything. We do not, however, see man ruling over all things now. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, so that through God's grace, he should die for everyone. We see him now crowned with glory and honor because of the death he suffered. It was only right that God, who creates and preserves all things, should make Jesus perfect through suffering in order to bring many sons to share his glory. For Jesus is the one who leads them to salvation. He purifies people from their sins, and both he and those who are made pure all have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his family. He says to God, I will tell my brothers what you have done. I will praise you in their meeting. He also says, I will put my trust in God. 
Here I am with the children that God has given me. Since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death and in this way set free those who are slaves for all their lives because of their fear of death. For it is clear that it is not the angels that he helps. Instead, he helps the descendants of Abraham. This means that he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every way in order to be their faithful and merciful high priest in his service to God so that the people's sins would be forgiven. And now he can help those who are tempted because he himself was tempted and suffered. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Thank you, David. We sing the hymn 573, Son of God, Eternal Saviour, 573.
hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ as recorded by Luke the Evangelist. When the time of the purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus, to do for him what was the custom of the law. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you did now dismiss your servant in peace. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which has been prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what had been said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after marriage, and then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. And coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they began to return to Galilee, to the town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of Jesus. Please be seated. May I speak with words that belong to the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Not long after the COVID pandemic um, began, 
uh, a man that I trade with regularly um, for feed for our colony um, of rabbits and guinea pigs. Um, and you are welcome to visit. Um, just book in with uh, Vera and she'll provide coffee and toasted tea cakes and goodness knows whatever else. Um, he, he said he couldn't get his head around how we were going to trade during the pandemic. Um, because I don't suppose it's any different in a place like Repton than it is in some of the um, places that Vera and I were brought up and have found ourselves living, where when you were doing a deal with somebody, to complete the deal, you would spit on your hand and then shake the other person's hand. And it was a sign that you could be trusted, that each party trusted the other. The other way of doing it, if you go far enough back, is you'd get your knife out of your pocket and you would cut the palm of your hand and blood would flow and you would mingle the blood one from the other as a sign of the transaction that should be made. Anyway, we've still not worked that one out because we only thought that the pandemic was going to last a few weeks. Perhaps if we'd have realized it was going to go on so long, we might have uh, put more thought into it. But the point is that so often in our life, whether it's our life outside the church, outside the faith, or whether it includes our life within the life of the church and within our faith in Jesus. So often there are warm rituals that underpin what we are doing. And those rituals can be very important. Some of these rituals are seen by other people and it gives them the opportunity to ask questions about what's going on and what we actually mean by this or the other. And as we meet to acknowledge the covenant today and to renew the covenant, it's not just to renew the covenant that's written on paper that says that as Christian people living and working and ministering uh, within Repton, and for that matter with the, within the whole benefice, um, should be committed to one another. But it also acknowledges the fact that God keeps covenant with his people and has done so uh, for a long time. There is a big difference between a covenant and a contract, a massive uh, difference. A covenant is based on love and friendship, whereas a contract is strictly a business arrangement. And therefore, to enter a covenant, to live within a covenant, we need to get to know one another in love and in truth, in mercy and in well-being. 
it's not surprising that our society does not have much room for covenant. And the society that we live in mostly goes in for contracts. But contracts fall apart and they lose their binding power where one or both of the partners in the contract fail to fulfill their part of the bargain. God never made a contract with us. God made a covenant with us. I, I was quite disturbed recently. Um, I, I, I'm a YouTube addict. I never thought I would be. Um, but I spend quite a lot of time looking at YouTube. And um, I, was, uh, I was watching a, a marriage service from Tewkesbury Abbey in the Diocese of Gloucester. And I was so surprised when the um, assistant priest at Tewkesbury Abbey talked about the marriage between two people as being a contract. I don't believe it is a contract. It's a covenant. A covenant between a man and a woman that is endorsed and encouraged by God. God is a God of power. But more importantly, God is a God of love and mercy. In dealing with us, God chose to follow the way of love rather than the way of power. God wants to be loved by us. He doesn't want us to fear him. If you love someone, you give them the room and the right to be themselves. If you want power over someone, you try to control them and make them do what you want them to do, whether they want to do it or not. But you can't do both at the same time. Love and power are incompatible. In order to love and to be loved, God has given us room to choose. He cannot have all the power and leave none for us. The covenant between God and humanity has to be more than a, a matter of an almighty God laying down the law. It has to be an agreement freely entered into between two parties that are free to covenant together. If we obey God because we're afraid of him, because we are so overwhelmed by his might that we do not dare to challenge him, then he has our obedience, but he will never have our love. One of the things that I like about the lectionary in this first part of a new year is that there are some really meaty chunks of the Old Testament to read. And there are many examples that tell us of the solemn covenant that God made with our father Abraham. After the story of creation, the record of covenant is a key moment in the Old Testament. The story 
of our redemption as the people of God can be said to begin here. For God did not abandon his fallen people, but through Father Abraham entered into a special relationship with his people. The relationship was not that sort of relationship that exists between trading partners. It was more like the relationship that exists between husband and wife in a good marriage. It is summed up in a formula which is repeated many times in the Old Testament. You will be my people and I will be your God. It was not Abraham, but God who took the initiative in this relationship. God promised him a numerous and unbroken line of descendants. He also promised his descendants that they would have a land of their own and said that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed because the Messiah would come from the family of Father Abraham. And even though people broke God's covenant, God never abandoned them. Instead, through his son Jesus Christ, he bound himself even more closely to the human family by a bond of love that can never be broken. God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled in Jesus. And it is through him that the Messiah, that all the nations of the earth are blessed. And Jesus sealed the covenant anew by shedding his blood upon the altar of the cross at Calvary. Through him, we have a close bond with God. We are not just his people. We are his sons and daughters. We are his family. Jesus is the head of the new people of God. And the land to which he is leading us to is not an earthly piece of land, but the land of eternal life. May eternal promise, may eternal life, may the love of the Father be yours through the covenant that we renew and keep together. Amen. And so we recall that God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, chosen to bear witness to his steadfast love by finding delight in the law. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ our Lord, in his life, his work, 
his death and resurrection. In him, all people may be set free from sin and from its power and united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises us new life in Christ. For our part, we promise to live no longer for ourselves, but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us, to renew the covenant which binds them and binds us to God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us again accept our place within this covenant which God has made with us and with all who are called to be Christ's disciples. This means that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us and the call to love and serve God in all our life and work. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ, who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves to him, trusting in his promise and relying on his grace. Eternal God, in your faithful and enduring love, you call us to share in your gracious covenant in Jesus Christ. In obedience, we hear and accept your commands. In love, we seek to do your perfect will. With joy, we offer ourselves anew to you. We are no longer our own, but yours. Your will, not mine, be done in all things, wherever you may place me, in all that I do, and in all that I may endure, when there is work for me, and when there is none, when I am troubled, and when I am at peace. Your will be done when I am valued, and when I am disregarded, when I find fulfillment, and when it is lacking, when I have all things and when I have nothing, I willingly offer all that I have and am to serve you and as a woman choose. Glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. May it be so forever. Let this covenant now made on earth be fulfilled in heaven. Amen. Please be seated. I'll kneel. To the bidding, Lord, have mercy, we respond, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Let us pray. Holy God, we bring before you all that we are, with as much honesty and openness as we can. We know your church is weakened by disunity, misplaced priorities, complacency and fear. We pray for a new awakening of our calling to be the people of God. Give us fresh understanding of your will and empower us with your spirit that your life may be lived out in us. 
Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy God, give all the nations and peoples of our world such respect and love for creation that we may learn to take proper responsibility for the resources we share and the universe we inhabit. Give us courage to make good decisions, even if they involve us in conflict or discomfort. Remember those who cared for us when we were young, and those who have no one to love and care for them. Remember all young families and all the children in our parishes. Help us to provide a nurturing community that they may grow in their faith and come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. We pray for the work of Sunday schools, of Message Church, of Youth Alpha, for those who lead them each week. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We remember the elderly faithful, and especially those who are housebound and can no longer join us to worship in person. We thank you for their example and ask you to increase our love for one another across those of different ages, from the very young to the elderly. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy God, we bring to you those we know who are suffering with prolonged illness, debilitating pain, emotional distress. Lay your hands upon them to bring relief and healing. Courage to live through this dark time and the inner strength which only you can give. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy God, we pray for those making the journey through death and those who have died to this earthly life. We thank you for all they have given us. And we remember especially Jean Appleby and Peter Williams. Comfort those who miss them, and through your mercy receive us all in our time to live in the peace and joy of your eternity. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Father, your Christ is revealed as the one destined to be rejected. Look in mercy on us who now turn towards his passion. Lord God, you kept faith with Simeon and Anna and showed them the infant king. Give us grace to put all our trust in your promises and the patience to wait for their fulfilment. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life together. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, 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 peace. Our offertory hymn is 505, Lord Jesus Christ.
The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away from you, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made us all. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. And as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son, as we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise. Lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we 
share together in this sacred meal you will be offered the body of Christ and those of you who are watching this service by live stream are called to share spiritually in what is taking place as the pres president at this table today I am the only one who on your behalf will take the wine I do so as a privilege on your behalf as we share at this table. Body of Christ.
we say together the prayer at the top of page 8. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that in the strength of your spirit we may give ourselves for others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn is the hymn on the sheet. This is the truth we hold. Heavenly Father, there is but one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So we may henceforth be all of one heart and of one soul. And may we, with one mind and one mouth, glorify you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and amongst all for whom you will pray this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name and power of Christ. Amen.